Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit with the bold access that you've given us by faith. We're just so thankful for all of your many blessings. I just ask that you would seal to our hearts that which is truth, filtering out all of the foolishness. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We have arrived to the in the year to the year 2021. <clears throat> So if nothing else, we can say that, Lord willing, we uh, survived the year 2020. So I just want to wish everyone out there a blessed, a happy new year. And uh, I just want to point out something that I find interesting. That uh, Many of you who follow this channel, you remember back in 2017, the spiritual new year 5778, which was, there's a lot that could be said about 5778. The Hebrew year 5778. Uh, it began on September 21 of 2017. It was followed by the Revelation 12 sign a couple of days later. But the spiritual new year began on, on the 21st of September of that year. To uh, January 21 of 2021, 20, which uh, you know, would be one two one uh, two one. An interesting uh, series of, of uh, uh, digits uh, in and of itself. We have no idea what's going to happen on January twenty one. Uh, I think it's impossible to say. You know, well, uh, things are just going to go kind of go along as as usual as normal on. On uh, right after the inauguration of uh, the uh, president-elect Joe Biden or uh, or Trump serving a second term, but uh, nevertheless, the first day of, of the new president would be January 21, and that just happens to be 40 months exact, 40 months uh, from September 21, 5778, 2017, and. 40 uh, is represented in Scripture as a period of trial and testing. So I just found that interesting. I want to pass that along. Now, in, in a recent video, I believe it was in my last video, or it may have been the one before it, uh, I, I stated my belief that it didn't matter uh, because we were under grace and not law, and that we are redeemed solely because Jesus Christ died in our place, that it doesn't matter how we live. And I want to clarify what I meant by that because I don't want people misunderstanding me and I, I think the, a few have. Folks, listen to me. God has nothing against you. Now, we know that the flesh profits nothing. And since the, the flesh profits nothing and your new creation is sinless, it cannot sin the, the new nature is sinless, okay? Uh, it's a point that most Christians miss because what we're dealing with there is we're dealing with the reality of, of our uh, lives as believers in Christ that we are no longer a single-natured individual. We are a dual-natured individual. We have two natures. The non-believer has one. He can do nothing but sin. He's, he hasn't been made a new creation in Christ. But we, as new creations in Christ, we have received a new sinless nature. We had to have, to have been made a dual-natured creature because Christ came to live inside us and He cannot be tainted. He cannot be touched by sin. So we had to be, God had to create a sinless new creature, uh, creation, a new nature, in which He could abide in us. Are you following what I'm saying here? Now, all of this is confirmed by Scripture. So the question arises, shall we sin that grace may abound? God, God forbid, and everybody knows that verse. But many don't understand what that verse is saying. It is not saying God is more pleased with you when you do not sin because all the flesh does is sin. 
That's, that is why we are to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see the dual natures, the, the, the two natures in that statement. Dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We function, we operate it out, out of the new man, not the old. Okay? You are not gaining any merit with God by trying not to sin. That is a, a, a fictitious. Okay? That is not the truth. You can't change the old man. You can't change something that is totally corrupt and God is, which God has nothing to do with. Neither can you become any more righteous than what you already are in Christ. It, marvelous news, okay? You cannot improve upon the sinless new creation either, okay? So looking at the both of those, being that, that you cannot change the old man and, and you can't become any more righteous than what you already are in Christ because you've already been made the righteousness of God in Christ, the only thing that displeases God, which is seen repeatedly throughout the New Testament, it, it, even I will even say, as, go as far as to say, even, even in, in the Old Testament, is our functioning outside that realm of faith where we function outside that realm of unmerited favor in our conduct, believing that there's some value in our cleaning up the old man, the flesh, which profits nothing. Folks, this book, Scripture, is not a self... I've said this before. It is not a self-help book on how to become a better Christian, quote-unquote. What it is, is a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ and how that work, His work, has application to your life. The only reason that we don't desire to sin is because we have a sinless new, new nature which cannot sin. Okay? That hatred towards sin, that, that mindset is itself a characteristic of the sinless new man. No matter how much your sin nature manifests itself, you could never, ever, 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 ever out sin God's grace. Never. Okay? Therefore, it does not matter. It does not matter one bit how we as saints live as it regards our standing before God. Our standing. Okay? Please, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't change or alter or affect our standing before God. Of course it matters how we live as far as rewards are concerned. You know, whether we're going to bear fruit in our lives. But we also know that, we, that unless we've died to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God. But it does not affect your standing before God. And that was the point that I was trying to make. It's a marvelous truth that brings comfort and rest and joy and peace to, into, to the life of every believer in Christ. And it, and it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will take and illumine that, the truth of that to your life so that you can then rest in Christ. You know, the, the, the popular, the, the, I'd say the, the, the most common, the most popular inference uh, is that you know, well, th this is a verse, you know, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's a verse that suggests, what, what that says is we can control and we should control or we should contain the sin nature. That is not what that verse is saying. Keep reading. Keep reading. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay? Live any longer therein what? The old man. There's no life in the old man. There's no life in the flesh. The law doesn't produce life. Life is not found in our trying to dress up a dead corpse. Okay, God forbid that we seek to find life in that which is dead, that is crucified with Christ. Know ye not that, it, that so many of us as were baptized, that is, identified with Christ, in, into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into His death. Therefore, we're buried with Him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so in the same way we, sh we also should walk in newness of life, resurrection life, His life, His life manifest in and through our sinless new creation. God has promised to do that. God can do nothing but that. He Nothing, God cannot produce anything good in us through the flesh. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify that before we go on in our study in Revelation. This will be uh, part 17. We're going to be looking at the rider on the white horse. Um, I'd kind of hope that I could cover all four riders of the apocalypse, you know, in one video. I don't think I want to do that. I think what I'd like to do is focus at least this entire video on the rider on the white horse. Okay? So first we have to identify who this is. It sounds like a, a great place to start. Now folks, I could, uh, I've gone back and forth with this. I, I can argue with myself. I can, I can, I can sit over here, I can say, you know, I can talk to myself, I can say, okay, well, the rider on the white horse, it must be the Antichrist. And for this reason, and this reason, and this other reason, and so on and so forth. And then I can, I can, I can argue back with myself and I can say, well, you know, no, that's not true. The rider on the white horse must represent Christ. He's wearing a crown. No, he's, he's riding a white horse. You know, he, he's got, he's got a bow, you know, uh, but, but no, no, wait a minute, no, the, you know, and I could do that. And, you know, and we can keep score. And, and we, could find, we could find out in the end that we're wasting our time, that it doesn't, it's not, you know, the white horse doesn't represent either. It doesn't represent Christ. It doesn't represent the Antichrist. Perhaps it's, it represents the gospel. Perhaps it represents the Word of God. And so, you know, we got our work cut out for us. We've got to look at a lot of Scripture references, a lot of cross-referencing. There's a lot of cross-referencing to do. There's a lot of thought and meditation, and, and there should be prayer and meditation, you know, involved in trying to determine, at least to the best of our ability, who this writer is. The temptation, I believe, is there on, on, the, most, on the part of most Christians is, is to see this writer as, well, it's got to be the Antichrist because he's included in, with, along with the, the, the other three writers, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, of course, a good argument for that is, well, Christ is the one opening the seal, and so, you know, the writer is, goes forth, okay? Uh, we see that the writer is loosed. It, he goes forth to conquer, and so it can't be Christ because Christ is the one opening the seal, okay? And so it can't, obviously it can't be Christ. You know, it must be the Antichrist. But then why would the Antichrist be wearing you know, riding a white horse, you know, why, why not a, you know, uh, some other colored horse? Why would he be going to war right at the beginning? You know, if it's Christ, why would he be going, you know, forth to battle with a bow, you know, right at the beginning before any of the other three horses uh, go forth and, you know, so on and so forth. So is Revelation six two is it is it the first writer, uh, uh, Christ is Christ the first writer? Is it the gospel? Is it the word? Is it the Antichrist or is it something else? Uh, I believe the, the uh, from what I've looked at, there's there's been over at least thirty possibilities uh, presented as to who the identity of this first writer on the white horse is, and of course that would take many videos to go through all of that. I, so I don't, I'm, I don't want to do that. I do want to take and look at, you know, the, the, the uh, I just thought it would be a, a, a good idea to take and focus on the most, the more common interpretations of this. So we're going to, uh, we're going to start off here by, with an argument for this being the Antichrist, not Christ. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow, the battle bow shall be cut off. 
and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. That's Zechariah chapter 9. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. We're talking about the Antichrist. That's in Daniel chapter 8. We know that the horse itself is the symbol of worldly power. Just like the, uh, the, the, the ass is the, uh, or donkey, is, is a, a symbol of meekness. Okay? Some put their trust, some, sa says the psalmist, put their trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God, Psalm 27. Uh, in, in Psalm chapter 33, a horse is but a vain thing to save a man. In Psalm 147, he delights not in the strength of a horse. In Scripture, the horse is spoken of in relation to uh, a, the in, an instrument of war. It represents, the horse represents human might, conflict, battle, war, which is either to be connected to the Lord or destroyed by Him. Micah, if we go over to Micah chapter 5, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. And in Revelation chapter 13, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast, and keep in mind the Antichrist has many names, beast being one of them. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the term Antichrist is only used by John you know, in First uh, John, Second John, and saw a beast. So he has many names. And this beast uh, rose up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. But this this is crowns. That's that's cr crowns plural. Okay, not a single crown, which is what we're looking at in verse two here of chapter. Six, and and uh, not Stephanos, you know, a victor's crown. If the first writer here, folks, is the Antichrist, he's seen wearing a crown like just like same word, just like that we will cast before God's throne. Just just same word as the twenty four elders which I believe represent the church, are casting before God's throne. The same type crown that, that we are rewarded with. Same crown. Okay? I want you to take note of that. If, if this first writer here is the Antichrist, he's seen wearing a crown just like we are. Now, so, you know, maybe I'm prejudiced. And, and maybe, you know, my name is Stephen... That's Stephanos. That's the same word in the Greek. It's the same word for crown. Stephanos. My name. So maybe I'm prejudiced. I don't like the idea of the Antichrist going forth to conquer the world, you know, with my name on his head. It's, and I've always tried to caution myself, folks, from reading my emotions into this, reading my, my own prejudices into the text. Uh, reading anything into the text. We want to be involved in exegesis, taking, bringing out of the text what's there, not reading our own feelings and ideas into the text. So the idea is that, you know, well, this must be the Antichrist simply because he's followed by the other three writers of the Apocalypse. Okay? However, however, I believe I can also make a, a, a basically sound, fairly sound argument uh, for this being Christ, not the Antichrist. I believe we are looking here at Christ as being the rider on the white horse if we look at certain factors. Uh, 
take certain factors into consideration. There's, there's probably at least a dozen reasons why I'm, I believe that we could draw that conclusion. The color white, for one. The horse is white. And in Scripture, we see God's white hair. We got white hair. We got white robes, white, white clouds, uh, white stones, uh, a white throne. I mean, the believers washed whiter than snow. You know, angels dressed in white. You know, white, 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 white. So, you know, and we follow Christ when He returns riding on white horses. White represents purity and so on and so forth. So that's a good argument for it being Christ. Now, the other side of the, that argument is that, you know, it's, it's by peace He deceives many, the Antichrist. He's a deceiver. The Antichrist is a great deceiver. He, he could arrive on the scene. I mean, I'm sure He's not going to have a sign on His back that says... You know, I'm the Antichrist. So that's the other side of the argument. So you can argue it, that both ways. The crown is, is given the rider who is seen as a warrior. Uh, note that it's, he, uh, it's given him. He doesn't take it. It's given him. And he's seen as a warrior because he already, he, al he already goes forth as a conqueror, a victor. Therefore, uh, the, the, the goal of his going forth has already been reached. If, if you look at the writer as the Antichrist, the, the, the Antichrist is not ultimately victorious. Okay, He only hopes that he will be. He only hopes that he will win. You know, he, he, he perhaps believes that he will, he will win. But he's not an overcomer. He's a failed overcomer. It's a vain, temporary, worldly victory. And the verse clearly states that this writer does conquer. Well, so it depends on whether you want to take that and, and I guess, and, and just take the position that his conquering, because it does say that he conquers, is temporary, temporal. But, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a, I've always been kind of a stickler for terms. He went forth overcoming. Nikao is the Greek word. And that he might conquer. Note, note it says he went forth overcoming and that he might overcome. Okay? Which, in my opinion, can only be said of a power whose, whose victories are... To, to last forever. It is the same word of the believer being an overcomer. Okay? Same word for you and I overcoming. Same word for Christ being the overcomer. Same word. He went forth overcoming and that He might overcome. Okay? So, again, you know, now, now if you folks are keeping score, if y'all are out there and kind of giving points, you know, you know, you got, you got, you're writing down on one side of the paper. You know, the Antichrist, and the other side, Christ, and you're keeping score, and you're, and then you t at the end of all this, you tally up the score, and whoever wins has the most points. Well, that's, that's, you know, and you say, well, that's the interpretation I'm going to go with. I don't even know if that would work, because we could be wrong about, about any of this. But we are tasked. Tasked, that, that's T-A-S-K-E-D, hard word for me to say for some reason, with trying to, to determine with the best of our ability who this writer is because it's going to determine all the rest. I mean, if we get, it's kind of like if we start off on the wrong foot here and we get the, the first writer on the white horse with the crown and the bow wrong, well, that, that might affect you know, I, I wouldn't even say might. I would say it will obviously affect the outcome or, or our conclusion, as or it'll it'll drive the narrative as to where we go when we go forward in this. Now, most scholars re regard the first horseman as identical with the one in Revelation chapter 19. Now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And who who sat on him was called faithful and true, 
Now we know who this is. It's our Lord. And in righteousness He judges and makes war. Okay? Now, personally, I, I don't have any problem with Jesus opening the seal and being the rider, the, the rider in the seal, the rider on the white horse, being the, the rider that the seal describes. I don't have any problem with that myself. I don't. I, I have no problem with that. Many do. You know, I realize we're seeing Christ here open this first seal as He does all the rest, but I think we're seeing here that the Lord could possibly be first going forth to bring about that end which we see in chapter 19. Not physically. He doesn't return until the end of the tribulation period. But uh, in, in a spiritual sense. So, since Christ reveals all of the visions which follow, I want to suggest that it just might be possible here. It's just something for you to think about that the first rider is our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ, that He's going forth to conquer, okay? And He does so in the sense that He guides and He determines the course and, and the end of all the events that unfold, okay? That's a possibility. And I, I'm, I don't mind telling you folks, I love that, the idea of that. I love that possibility. You know, it begins with Him, it ends with Him. The Lord, we know the Lord's the beginning and the end, the first and the last, okay? We, that He'll triumph over all His enemies. But we, we also know that He doesn't take a, He's not someone to just sit back and, you know, allow things to unfold, that He's personally involved in every aspect of His creation. We also know that too. Uh since he's already most, most matter-of-factly, without question, victorious over them, I believe we're, we, we could be, it could be that we're being shown a picture of our, our triumphant, victorious uh, Lord Jesus Christ right here at the beginning before anything else is shown. That's what I'm saying. So, you know, it just it's, it depends. There's, it, there does seem to be a good argument on both sides. I have to admit that. I have to admit that. So I would suggest that it's possible that, that right here in, in verse 2 of chapter 6, that he, here he's working in bodily absence. Uh, the bow uh, is a weapon of, for, of distance, okay? Well, so you could, you could look at it that way. Uh, the bow can indicate that the rider, the warrior, may be meeting his foes at a distance. Okay, if you want to, if you want to look at the first rider as Christ, the rider being representative of Christ, just as the other riders are representative of other things. They're, they're symbols, they're representations of of things. So. A symbol of His power, His victorious power, His sovereign direction, His control over everything else that follows. You know, even if you wanted to take the writer as, uh, as literal, you know, the objection that the Lamb could not have been here opening the seals and be the writer Himself, I, I, I don't know, to me that argument falls flat since Christ is is God, and, and God is omnipresent. Notice he doesn't have any arrows. Just a bow. No quiver, no arrows. Uh, and I, what I find interesting and most interesting about that is we know that uh, without, it, it just says a bow, okay? Now, now maybe... Maybe, uh, I don't know how to say this, the absence of any mention of arrows, maybe that's, uh, uh, we can't draw any, uh, a, a really strong conclusion from that and say that, well, just because there are no arrows, that, uh, it must be Christ because, uh, he, he doesn't, uh, 
go to war. He's not. He's just in control over everything, and he and he's he's not at really at war with his enemies until he returns at the second coming, that, which we see in Revelation chapter nineteen. So. I guess what interests me about that is, is that if if you want to argue that this is the Antichrist, and we know that the Antichrist is responsible for a lot of destruction and a lot of death, it seems kind of odd to me that the writer has a bow with no arrows. So that's something else you might want to think about. But uh, I just wanted to put this out here as a sort of a kickoff, as a, as a, a lead-in into Chapter 6, where we're going to be looking at the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Uh, it is my understanding that the first four seals, uh, the first the four riders of the Apocalypse, take us up to the midpoint, where the, the, the fifth seal is sort of the bridge from the first half of the tribulation into the second half of the tribulation, the midpoint where the seal six and seven are uh, more represent the great tribulation period. And of course, we know uh, just by reading the text, we know that the, the seventh seal is really not a, uh, uh, is more of a, an announcement of the trumpet judgments that'll follow. And you've got seven, seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl judgments, okay? Now, what, you can't help but find it interesting that, that here we know that the tribulation period is a seven-year period, and yet we see all these sevens here. Uh, now, I'm not willing to, to uh, go as far as to... As to assert dogmatically that, well, because there's seven years in the tribulation period and there's seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowl judgments, that each one represents a year. I, I do not believe that, that the, the seal judgments occur and then the, uh, when all of those occur, after that's all done, then, then the trumpet judgments occur and, and then after the, all the trumpet judgments occur, then the bowl judgments occur, and I'm not sure that's how this works out. This plays out. It, it, I'm not sure how to even describe what I do believe here, except that just to say that that there may be because there are there's so many uh, similarities between these judgments, seals, trumpets, and bowls that uh, uh, it just, the entire thing, but all three, seals, trumpets, and bowls, represent the entire seven-year period. Seven period. But it, it's also interesting that you have the, the three sevens, and those three sevens, of course, uh, add up to 21. I also find it interesting that now, that, and it's worth mentioning, we're just beginning the new year, 2021, and so uh, if uh, this is the year, the long-awaited year that we've been so looking anxious, anxiously looking for, the, the year of our blessed hope, where our Lord returns for us, the church, or that all these events then unfold, I find it interesting that it be, we're beginning it with a one, 2021. And uh, of course, if being that, that uh, at least it's our position here at this ministry, uh, Blessed Hope Forever, it's been our position that there's more evidence, far more evidence for a spring rapture than a fall one. So if he returns in the spring, May, uh, according to our timeline, May, which if you've watched our videos on that, there's a lot of interesting uh, data associated with that timeline. Sp spring of 2021, he would return spring of 2028. So it would cover the first seven years of this new decade. And I find that interesting, or that 2028 then would mark, you know, uh, a new beginning, the number eight meaning a new beginning. Well, look, I'm out of time. I just want to take a moment 
to tell you all that uh, is first of all as it regards my own personal uh, medical issues and my health uh, there are some problems but I'm trying to trust the Lord for that work that out on this end or that uh, uh, I can continue and, and, and remain with you folks for as long as, as we are here uh, there are some problems and uh, it's not it's, it's no, nothing I don't want any of you worrying about anything at the at this point there's nothing that I uh, I can't say for certain uh, uh, be I can't be dogmatic about anything at this point I just do know that that they are concerned about some issues uh, and so there's going to be some more tests done that have to do with uh, uh, some things that are uh, other than uh, the 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 injury, the horse wreck that I had recently, uh, that uh, may lead to uh, some more complications, uh, more medications. I uh, hope not surgeries, but you know, folks. I know there's many of you out there that are suffering, and suffering greatly. I just I pray every day that you will find his peace through that the peace that he gives that you will trust him in all things he's promised never to leave you nor forsake you he he lights your path he bottles your tears until next time i want to thank you all for all of your continued support your love your prayers your messages please follow us on me we if you should so feel led. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.